Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. And today we're finally going to return to the law of one, the raw material. I've had several episodes where we've summarized the law of one material. We've gone into some different aspects of it, including how the raw material discusses the higher self and intelligent infinity. If you're not aware, the law of one material is a channeled set of material that was given in the 80s and it has a lot of authenticity and is quite interesting in its rigid accurateness and analysis and the language that it uses and the way that it was recorded almost in a scientific basis there were three people involved in the channeling one that asked questions one that was completely out Carla Ruckert and one that recorded the information that was channeled Jim McCarty and I recommend that you read or listen to the previous episodes I've done and read the law of one material at law of one dot info where you can get a full summary of every single channeled session raw is referred to as a social memory complex which is an advanced society coming from the planet Venus, which has been around for billions of years and is so advanced, they've tried to help the earth on several occasions and may have made some mistakes as they explain. And I recommend you listen to my episode, which kind of summarizes some of the things they talk about, which is so mind blowing. I keep on having this dream about Venus because when, when you talk about Venus, you say, oh, there's no way anybody can live on Venus. We look at it all the time. It's so hot. It's this wasteland. But I keep on having these dreams that Venus is kind of like Wakanda, that that's all a glamour. And then in fact, it's a beautiful planet. Who knows if that's true or not? But the raw material, it was an attempt for them to give us information and help us move toward a greater understanding of the law of one. The law of one is their idea that the universe is created by one creator and we are all one, which is similar to what, for instance, Neville Goddard might say and many other spiritual disciplines. The language used by Ra is oftentimes very complicated. The most difficult part of the law of one material is on the tarot. I haven't really talked about the tarot very much and I was wanting to do a meditation pretty soon around some different tarot cards. I don't believe in looking at the tarot as a way of predicting the future, though I think it can be effective in doing that. I believe in the pearl of great price and that that pearl is I believe that I can create my reality. So I don't want a tarot reading to tell me that my reality is going to be something else than I create. And that's not the purpose of the tarot as described by Ra. In this discussion, they explain that the tarot, as it was originally formed, was a description of the archetypes of the universe, particularly this solar system and the logos of the sun, when they uh, started to analyze the different archetypes of the mind they found that there were these different archetypes which could be broken down. For instance, you have all of these different parts and characters in the tarot and they represent archetypes of the mind and actually helps you to understand who you are on a much more deeper metaphysical scale. It's harder for me to explain. The best thing I can do is read this session on the tarot. It's a general session. There is so much material and we may go further if you want to. Uh, They break down what the cards are, the matrix of the mind, the potentiator of the mind, the catalyst of the mind, experience of the mind, significator of the mind, and they break the tarot down into parts talking about the mind, the body, and the spirit. If you have followed the law of one material, they refer to you as a mind-body-spirit complex. And they're very specific about that, that they are sort of separate and together the mind, body, and the spirit. And the tarot kind of helps us to understand these distinctions. And we also kind of get a history of the tarot and where it came about, 
according to Ra. So in these sessions, I will take out the parts where Ra says I am Ra. So it kind of flows a little bit better. But the point of this is to understand what they're talking about in terms of the archetypes. I think that if we ultimately meditate on these archetypes, we can understand who we are. For instance, the fool is a character in the tarot, is a card in the tarot, and the fool can represent the void, the point where you don't know anything that you are open to all. And each of the different characters, the magician, each of the different characters in the tarot represent aspects or states that you can enter. And a compilation of all of these states is what we're trying to do. This refers back to Neville Goddard. Neville Goddard is saying that the Bible is saying that we're going through a number of different states, that the Bible is explaining these different states. Some people see these states described in the horoscope or astrology or a number of things, and they probably do. It's not about predicting your future. It's a better understanding of your soul and who you are. So to begin, in the 76th session, Ra is asked, Sorry we had such a long delay between the last session and this one. It couldn't be helped. Could you please tell me the origin of the tarot? Ra says, I am Ra. The origin of this system of study and divination is twofold. Firstly, there is that influence which, coming in a distorted fashion from those who were priests attempting to teach the law of one in Egypt, gave form to the understanding, if you will pardon the misnomer, which they had received. These forms were then made a regular portion of the learned teachings of an initiate. The second influence is that of those entities in the lands you call Ur, Chaldea, and Mesopotamia, who from old had received the, shall we say, data for which they called having to do with the heavens. Thusly, we find two methods of divination being melded into one with uneven results, the, as you call it, astrology, and the form being combined to suggest what you might call the correspondences, which are typical of the distortions you may see as attempt to view archetypes. Question then am I correct in assuming that the priests in Egypt, in attempting to convert knowledge they had received initially from Ra into understandable symbology, constructed and initiated the concept of the tarot? Is this correct? This is correct, with the addition of the Sumerian influence. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the plan of this Logos for its creation and examine the philosophical basis that is the foundation for what was created in this local creation and the philosophy of the plan for experience. I'm assuming that I'm correct in stating that the foundation for this, as we have stated many times before, is the first distortion. After that, what was the plan in a philosophical sense? We cannot reply due to a needed portion of your query, which has been omitted. That is, do we speak of this particular Logos? That is correct. I'm asking you with respect to this particular Logos, our Sun, in creating the experience of its planetary system and the sub-logi of it. This query has substance. We shall begin by turning to an observation of a series of complexes and concepts of which you are familiar as the tarot. The philosophy was cr to create a foundation first of mind, then of body, then of spiritual complex. Those concept complexes you call the tarot lie in three groups of seven. The mind cycle, one through seven. The physical cycle, eight through fourteen. The spiritual complex cycle, fifteen through twenty-one. The last complex may best be termed the choice. Upon the foundation of transformation of each complex with free will guided by the root concepts offered in these cycles, the Logos offered this density, the basic architecture of a building and constructing and synthesizing of data culminating in the choice. 
then for me to condense your statement i see it meaning there are seven basic philosophical foundations for mental experience seven for bodily seven for spiritual and that these produce the polarization that we experience sometime during the third density cycle this may be very poorly stated on my part am i close to correct you are correct in that you perceive the content of our prior statement with accuracy you were incorrect in that you have no mention of the shall we say location of all these concept complexes that is they exist within the roots of the mind and it is from this resource that their guiding influence and light motives may be traced you may further note that each foundation is itself not single but a complex of concepts furthermore there are relationships betwixt mind body and spirit of the same location in octave for instance 1 8 15 and relationships within each octave which are helpful in the pursuit of the choice by the mind body spirit complex the logos under which these foundations stand is one of free will thusly the foundations may be seen to have unique facets and relationships for each mind body spirit complex only 22 the choice is relatively fixed and single i'm probably having a problem with the concept of time since it appears that the logos was aware of the polarization choice it seems that this choice for polarization at the end of third density is an important philosophical plan for the experience past third density am i correct in assuming that this process is a process to create the proper or the desired experience that will take place in the creation after third density is complete these philosophical foundations are those of third density ross says above this density there remains the recognition of the architecture of the logos but without the veils which are so integral a part of the process of making the choice in third density then they ask did this particular logos the sun that we experience plan for this polarity and know all about it prior to its plan that i suspect is what happened ra says that is quite correct in that case you would have as logos you would have the advantage of selecting the form of acceleration i might say of spiritual evolution by planning for what we call the major archetypal philosophical foundation and planning these as a function of the polarity that would be gained in third density is this correct this is exquisitely correct ross says in that case it seems that a thorough knowledge of the precise nature of these philosophical foundations would be of primary importance to the study of evolution of mind body and spirit and i would like to carefully go through each of these basic 21 starting with the mind if the that is agreeable with raw this is agreeable with two requests which must be made firstly that an attempt be made to state the student's grasp of each archetype we may then comment we cannot teach learn to the extent or learn teaching secondly we request that it be constantly kept before the mind as the candle before the eye that each mind body spirit complex shall and should and indeed must perceive each archetype if you use this convenient term in its own way therefore you may see that precision is not the goal rather quality of general concept complex perception is the goal question would you elucidate with respect to the significator you spoke of the original significators may undifferentiatedly be termed the mind the body and the spirit so the original the first evolution was planned by the logos but the first distortion was not extended to the product at some point this first distortion was extended and the first service to self polarity emerged is this correct and if so could you tell me the history of this process and emergence ross says as a prom let me state that the logoi always conceived of themselves as offering free will to the sub logoi in their care the sub logoi had freedom to experience and experiment with consciousness the experiences of the body and the illumination of the spirit that having been said we shall speak to the point of your query the first logos to instill 
what you now see as free will in the full sense in its sub logi came to this creation due to contemplation in depth of the concepts or possibilities of conceptualizations of what we have called the significators. The Logos posited the possibility of the mind, the body, and the spirit as being complex. In order for the significator to be what it is not, then it first must be granted the free will of the Creator. This set in motion a quite lengthy, in your term, series of Logi improving or distilling this seed thought. The key was the significator becoming a complex question. Then our particular Logos, when it created its own particular creation, was at some point far down the evolutionary spiral of the experiment with the significator becoming what it was not, or in effect creating the polarity that we strive for in third density. And therefore was, I am assuming, primarily concerned in the design of the archetypes in designing them in such a way so they would create the acceleration of this polarization. Is this in any way correct? I am wrong. We would only comment briefly. It is generally correct. You may fruitfully view each logos and its design as the creator experiencing itself. The seed concept of the significator being a complex introduces two things. Firstly, the creator against creator in one sub logos in what you may call dynamic tension. Secondly, the concept of free will once having been made fuller by its extension into the sub logi known as mind body spirit complexes creates and recreates and continues to create as a function of its very nature. Question, are the seven archetypes for mind a function of or related to the seven densities that are to be experienced in the octave? I am raw. The relationship is tangential in that no congruency may be seen. However, the progress through the archetypes has some of the characteristics of the progress through the densities. These relationships may be viewed without being, shall we say, pasted upon one another. Question, how about the seven bodily energy centers? Are they related to the archetypes in some way? Ross says the same may be said of these. It is informative to view the relationships, but stifling to insist upon the limitations of congruency. Recall at all times, if you would use this term, that the archetypes are a portion of the resources of the mind complex. Then, is there any relationship between the archetypes and the planets of our system? This is not a simple query. Properly, the archetypes have some relationship to the planets. However, this relationship is not one which can be expressed in your language. This, however, has not halted those among your people who have become adepts from attempting to name and describe these relationships. To most purely understand, if we may use this misnomer, the archetypes, it is well to view the concepts which make up each archetype and reserve the study of planets and other correspondences for meditation. Question. It was probably the design of the Logos by doing this to allow the conscious mind greater freedom under the first distortion by partitioning, you might say, the individualized portions of this from the potentiator or unconscious, which had greater communication with the total mind, therefore allowing for, you might say, the birth of uneducated, to use a poor term, portions of consciousness. Is this correct? This is roughly correct, Ross says. Could you de-roughen it, elucidate it on it a bit? I am raw. This is intervening material before we may do so question. Now we are getting to what I was trying to determine. Then at this point, were there still only nine archetypes and the veil had just been drawn between the matrix and the potentiator? There were nine archetypes and many shadows. By shadows, do you mean what I might refer to as the birthing of small archetypal biases? Rather, we would describe these shadows, Ross says, as the inchoate thoughts of helpful structures not yet fully conceived. Then at this point, would the choice exist at this point, the creation of the first service to self-polarity? Is there a choice at that point or is it a non-choice? Ross says, implicit in the veiling or separation of two archetypes is the concept of choice. The refinements to this concept took many experiences. Okay, they ask, at the present time, 
we are experiencing the effects of a more complex or greater number of archetypes. And I have guessed that the ones we are experiencing now for the mind work as follows. We have the magician and high priestess, which corresponds to the matrix and potentiator, which have the veil drawn between them, which is the primary creator of the extension of the first distortion. Is that correct? Ross says, we are unable to answer this query without intervening material. They then ask, thank you. I'd like to ask you as the initial production of the tarot, where this concept was first formed and where the tarot was first recorded. Where did this, the very first concept? Ross says, the concept of the tarot originated within the planetary influence you call Venus. Question, was the concept given to, let me ask you, say it originated there. Was this concept devised for a training tool for those inhabiting Venus at that time, or was it devised by those of Venus as a training tool for those of Earth? Ross says the tarot was devised by the third density population of Venus, a great measure of your space time in your past. As we have noted, the third density experience of those of Venus dealt far more deeply and harmoniously with what you'd call relationships with other selves, sexual energy transfer work, and philosophical or metaphysical research, the product of many, many generations of work upon what we conceive to be the archetypal mind produced the tarot, which was used by our peoples as a training aid in developing the magical personality. Question, I'll make a guess that those of Venus third density who were the initial ones to partially penetrate the veil gleaned information as to the nature of the archetypal mind and the veiling process and from this designed the tarot as a method of teaching others. Is that correct? Ross says, it is so. They then ask, I will make this statement as to my understanding of some of the archetypes and let you correct this statement. It seems to me that the significator of mind, body, and spirit are acted upon in each of these by the catalyst. This produces experience, which then leads to the transformation and produces the great way. This is the same process for mind, the body, and spirit. The archetypes are just repeated, but act in a different way as catalyst because of the differences of mind, body, and spirit. They produce a different type of experience for each because of the differences in the three. The transformation is slightly different. The great way is somewhat different, but the archetypes are all basically doing the same thing. They are just acting on three different portions of the mind, body, spirit complex so that we can condense the entire archetypal mind into a way of saying that in making the significator a complex, basically we have provided a way for catalyst to create transformation more efficiently. Would you correct my statement, please? Ross says in your statement, correctness is so plated up with tendrils of the most fundamental misunderstanding that correction of your statement is difficult. We shall make comments and from these comments request that you allow a possible realignment of conceptualization to occur. The archetypal mind is a great and fundamental portion of the mind complex. One of its most basic elements and one of the richest sources of information for the seeker of the one infinite creator. To attempt to condense the archetypes is to make an erroneous attempt. Each archetype is a significant ding on sich or thing in itself with its own complex of concepts. While it is informative to survey the relationships of one archetype to another, it can be said that this line of inquiry is secondary to the discovery of the purest gestalt or vision or melody, which each archetype signifies to both the intellectual and intuitive mind. The significators of mind, body, and spirit complexes are complex in and of themselves, and the archetypes of catalyst experience transformation and the great way are most fruitfully viewed as independent complexes which have their own melodies with which they may inform the mind of its nature. We ask that you consider that the archetypal mind informs those thoughts which then may have bearing upon the mind, the body, or the spirit. The archetypes do not have a direct linkage to body or spirit. All must be drawn up through the higher levels of the subconscious mind to the conscious mind and thence they may flee whither they have been bidden to go. 
When used in a controlled way, they are most helpful. Rather than continue beyond the boundaries of your prior statement, we would appreciate the opportunity for your re-questioning at this time so that we may answer you more precisely. I will ask the following questions to clear up possibly only the method of teaching these concepts, which may give me important clues to understanding the concepts themselves. Did Ra use cards similar to the tarot cards for the training purpose in third density? Ra says no. What did Ra use in third density? I am Ra. You are aware in your attempts at magical visualization of the mental configuration of sometimes rather complex visualizations. These are mental and drawn with the mind. Another example well known in your culture is the visualization in your mass of the distortion of the love of the one infinite creator called Christianity wherein a small portion of your foodstuffs is seen to be a mentally configured but entirely real man, the man known to you as Jeheshua, or as you call this entity now, Jesus. It was by this method of sustained visualization over a period of training that we worked with these concepts. These concepts were occasionally drawn. However, the concept of one visualization per card was not thought of by us. Well, how did the teacher relay information to the student with respect to visualization? The process was Kabbalistic, that is, of the oral tradition of mouth to ear. Then when Ra attempted to teach the Egyptians the concept of the tarot, was the same process used or a different one? The same process was used, however, those which were teach learners after us first drew these images to the best of their ability within the place of initiation and later began the use of what you call cards bearing these visualizations representations question were the court arcana and the minor arcana a portion of Ra's teachings or was this something that came along later those cards of which you speak were the product of the influence of those of Chaldea and Sumer question Ra must have had a shall we say lesson plan or course of training for the 22 archetypes to be given to those of third density of Ra or later on to those in Egypt. Would you describe this scenario for the training course? I am Ra. This shall be the last full query of this working. We find it more nearly appropriate to discuss our plans in acquainting initiates upon your own planet with this particular version of the archetypes of the archetypal mind. Our first stage was the presentation of the images, one after the other, in the following order, 1, 8, 15, 2, 9, 16, 3, 10, 17, 4, 11, 18, 5, 12, 19, 6, 13, 27, 14, 21, 22. In this way, the fundamental relationships between mind, body, and spirit could begin to be discovered, for as one sees, for instance, the matrix of the mind, in comparison to the matrices of body and spirit, one may draw certain tentative conclusions. When at length the student had mastered these visualizations and had considered each of these seven classifications of archetype, looking at the relationships between mind, body, and spirit, we then suggested consideration of archetypes in pairs, one and two, three and four, five, six and seven. You may continue in this form for the body and spirit archetypes. You will note that the consideration of the significator was left unpaired, for the significator shall be paired with archetype 22. At the end of this line of inquiry, the student was beginning to grasp more and more deeply the qualities and resonance of each archetype. At this point, using various other aids, to spiritual evolution, we encourage the initiate to learn to become each archetype, and most importantly, to know as best as possible within your illusion when the adoption of the archetype's persona would be spiritually or metaphysically helpful. As you can see, much work was done creatively by each initiate. We have no dogma to offer. Each perceives that which is needful and helpful to the self. May we ask if there are any other brief inquiries? I have a deck here of 22 tarot cards which have been copied according to information we have from the walls of, I would suspect, the large pyramid of Giza. 
if necessary, we can duplicate these cards in the book that we are preparing. I would ask Ra if these cards represent an exact replica of that which is in the Great Pyramid. The resemblance is substantial. In other words, you might say that these were better than, say, 95% correct as representing what is on the walls of the Great Pyramid. Yes, Ra says. Then, could you tell me what information you gave to the Egyptian priest or Egyptian who first was contacted or taught with respect to the first archetype? Is that possible for you to do within the limits of the first distortion? Ra says, I am Ra. It is possible. Our first step, as we have said, was to present the descriptions in verbal form of three images, 1, 8, and 15. Then the questions were asked. What do you feel that a bird might represent? What do you feel that a wand might represent? What do you feel that the male represents? And so forth, until those studying were working upon a system whereby the images used became evocative of a system of concepts. This is slow work when done for the first time. We may note with sympathy that you undoubtedly feel choked by opposite difficulty, that of a great mass of observation upon the system, all of which has some merit, as each student will experience the archetypal mind and its structure in a unique way useful to that student. We suggest that one or more of this group do that which we have suggested in order that we may, without infringement, offer observations on this interesting subject, which may be of further aid to those inquiring into this area. Now, as I understand it, what you suggest as far as the tarot goes is to study the writings that we have available and from those formulate questions. Is this correct? Ra says no. Sorry, I didn't understand exactly what you meant with respect to that. Would it be appropriate then for me to answer the questions with respect to what I think is the meaning of the three items that you spoke of for card one and then card eight? Is that what you meant? Ra says, this is very close to our meaning. It was our intention to suggest that one or more of you go through the plan of study which we have suggested. The queries have to do with the archetypes as found in the tarot after this point may take the form of observing what seems to be the characteristics of each archetype. Relations between mind, body, and spiritual archetypes of the same ranking such as matrix or archetypes as seen in relationships to polarity, especially when observed in the pairings. Any observations made by a student which has fulfilled these considerations will receive our comments in return. Our great avoidance of interpreting for the first time for the learned teacher various elements of a picture upon a piece of pasteboard is involved both with the law of confusion and with the difficulties of the distortions of the pictures upon the pasteboard. Therefore, we may suggest a conscientious review of that which we have already been given concerning this subject as opposed to the major reliance being either upon any rendition of the archetype picture or any system which has been arranged as a means of studying these pictures. Now once again, this becomes very dense material to read. And if you're like me, you're probably getting a little bit lost. I'll do my best to summarize what I can understand here. They go on to say in another session, in the last session we discussed the first tarot card of the Egyptian type. Are there any distortions in the cards that we have, which we will publish in the book, that Ra did not originally intend, with the exception of the star, which we know is a distortion, or any additions that Ra did intend in this particular tarot? The distortions remaining after the removal of astrological material are those having to do with the mythos of the culture to which Ra offered this teach learning tool. This is why we have suggested approaching the images looking for the heart of the image rather than being involved overmuch by the costumes and creatures of a culture not familiar to your present incarnation. We have no wish to add to an already distorted group of images feeling that although distortion is inevitable, there is the least amount which you can procure in the present arrangement. And then are you saying that the cards that we have here are the best available cards in our present illusion at this date? Your statement is correct, Ross says, in that we consider the so-called Egyptian tarot the most undistorted version of the images which Ra offered. This is not to intimate that other systems may not, in their own way, form a helpful architecture for the adept's consideration of the archetypal mind. Then, 
they ask. This occurs between the potentiator of the mind is directly connected through the roots of the tree of mind to the archetypal mind and to the logos which created it and because the veil between the matrix and potentiator of the mind allows for the development of the will would raw comment some untangling may be needed as the mind body spirit complex which has not yet reached the point of conscious awareness of the process of evolution prepares for incarnation it has programmed to it a less than complete that is to say a partially randomized system of learnings the amount of randomness of potential catalyst is proportional to the newness of the mind-body-spirit complex to third density. This then becomes a portion of that which you may call a potential for incarnational experience. This is indeed carried within that portion of the mind, which is of the deep mind, the architecture of which may be envisioned as being represented by that concept complex known as the potentiator. It is not in the archetypal mind of an entity that the potential for incarnational experience resides in the mind-body-spirit complex's insertion, shall we say, into the energy web of the physical vehicle and the chosen planetary environment. However, to more deeply articulate this point of the mind-body-spirit complex's beingness, this archetype, the potentiator of the mind, may be evoked with profit to the student of its own evolution. The matrix of the mind is depicted seemingly as male on the card and the potentiator as female. Could Ra state why this is and how this affects these two archetypes? Ra says, Firstly, as we have said, the matrix of the mind is attracted to the biological male and the potentiator of the mind to the biological female. Thusly, in energy transfer, the female is able to potentiate that which may be within the conscious mind of the male so that it may feel inspirited. In a more general sense, that which reaches may be seen as a male principle. That which awaits the reaching may be seen as a female principle. The richness of the male and female system of polarity is interesting and we would not comment further, but suggest consideration by the student. Are there any uses at all of value of these images or tarot cards than the one I just stated? Ross says to the student, the tarot images offer a resource for learn teaching the process of evolution. To any other entity, these images are pictures and no more. Question. I was specifically thinking of the fact that Ra, in an earlier session, spoke of the tarot as a system of divination. Could you tell me what you meant by that? Ross says, due to the influence of the Chaldeans, the system of archetypal images was incorporated by the priests of that period into a system of astrologically based study, learning and divination. This was not a purpose for which Ra developed the tarot. Question, I'm at a loss to know the significance of the serpents that adorn the head of the entity on this drawing. Are they of Ra? And if so, what do they signify? I am Ra. They are cultural in nature. In the culture to which these images were given, the serpent was the symbol of wisdom. Indeed, to the general user of these images, perhaps the most accurate connotation of this portion of the concept complexes might be the realization that the serpent is that which is powerfully magical. In the positive sense, this means that the serpent will appear at the indigo race site upon the body of the image figures when a negative connotation is intended one may find the serpent at the solar plexus center <laughs> question i plan to redraw the tarot cards eliminating extraneous additions by those who came after ra's initial giving and i would like quickly to go through those things that i intend to eliminate from each card we've gone over and asked ra if there is anything else that should be eliminated to make the cards as they were when they were originally drawn before the astrological and other appendages were added I would eliminate all the letters around the edge of the card with the possible exception of the number of the card, one, two, three, etc. That would be the case for all the cards, I think. The exterior lettering and the numbering. In card number one, I would eliminate the star of the upper right hand corner. Eliminate the wand in the magician's hand. I understand that the sphere remains, but I am not really sure where it should be. Would Ra comment on that, please? I am Ra. Firstly, the elimination of letters is acceptable. Secondly, the elimination of stars is acceptable in all cases. Thirdly, the elimination of the wand is appropriate. Fourthly, the sphere may be seen to be held by the thumb and index and second finger. 
Fifthly, we would note that it is not possible to offer what you may call a pure deck, if you would use this term, of tarot due to the fact that when these images were first drawn, they were already a distortion in various and sundry ways, mostly cultural. Sixthly, although it is good to view the images without the astrological additions, it is to be noted that the more general positions, phases, and characteristics of each concept complex are those which are significant. The removal of all distortion is unlikely and to a great extent unimportant. We now have an additional set of tarot images, he says. We will refer to them as the Royal Road images since the name of the book they came from. They are similar to, but in some instances different from the C.C. Zayn images, which of these two sets are closer to Ra's original intention, and if they are mixed, let me know that. Ra says the principle which moves in accordance with the dynamics of teach learning with most efficiency is constancy. We would explore the archetypal mind using that set of images produced by the one known as Fathman, or we could use those which have been used. In point of fact, those which are being used have some subtleties which enrich the questioning. As we have said, this set of images is not that which we gave. This is not material. We could use any of a multitude of devised tarot sets. Although this must be at the discretion of the questioner, we suggest the maintaining of one and only one set of distorted images to be used for the querying and note that the images you now use are good. Now there are a lot of different sets of tarot and this discussion of tarot just boggles my mind a little bit. I am not somebody that has gone deeply into the tarot, but as somebody that's sort of a completist, I had to address this through an episode and I realized that I might have lost you by now. If you stuck with me all the way to here, we've compiled at least the beginning stages of the tarot so you could have a discussion about it. This has some very interesting side roads that you can go on if you research the tarot. For instance, if you research the Golden Dawn, the magical secret society that was used by Aleister Crowley, they used the the tarot decks in a very specific way. They had meditations that they would do and they would, for instance, just look at the fool, the lovers, the hierophant, the emperor, the high priestess, the magician, and they would just stare at that card and each would bring up a certain state. But let's just step outside of that. I don't think we need to make it that complicated. We know there are certain primary states that we're moving through. The interesting thing is that is how the solar system was designed. And the other interesting discussion is that there are star seeds that have come to this planet from other solar systems that had different archetypal systems. So it's some people say we have 23, 24 different alien species that are reincarnated on this planet. And that might be why you in particular are not understanding everyone else because you have a different archetypal mind. In any case, your particular mind has a set of archetypes. When we understand these archetypes, it helps us to understand ourselves. These are questions of gender, of confidence, of self, of love, of hate. Uh, all of these things that we're learning about ourselves come from different states. The fool, for instance, embodies whirling and blowing wing winds between worlds. The fool is pure existence without substance or form. This spirit falls into the abyss of mortality. This spirit becomes all that is, seems locked into form. Yet this one being rises freely back into the silence of formlessness or the magician. And the magician in the card gives you the power of magic. And you encounter this going from the fool to the magician is a set of steps that you go through. The high priestess and the empress and the emperor, all of them have a certain sort of state that you enter into. And if you listened to what Ross said, they were not using cards. They were doing visualizations. They were visualizing these particular states and they imply it had something to do with sexual energy interchanges. Who knows? I'm reading this material and I'm asking you to help me to understand because I don't understand. There is so much more that goes on after this on the matrix of the mind, the significator, the potentiator. I just don't understand. I've gone almost a year 
since I really started delving into the Law of One material just to do this episode. And even then, just reading it now, I'm lost. I'm considering not even posting this episode because it is so complicated. I know a lot of you are going to drop out in the middle of that episode as I'm reading that material, which is very easy to do with the raw material. But there is something there. There's something to this. If we can break down what are the main archetypes of our minds, of our bodies, of our spirits, and how they interrelate, and we're going through a path, and I'll have to go through and take the numbers of the different cards in the orders that they gave and see if there's some sort of relationship. Perhaps I can put that into a meditation for you. Many people, of course, that are listening or watching this episode are hugely experienced in the tarot and are very good at it. Terry Huberman is one I had an interview with that is very good at that. People who are psychic and instinctive can use these cards and it enlightens those psychic centers in their mind to see patterns that exist in the future. So who knows if this is something that you would be interested in. I would love to know your opinions on it and what you think this means. And if anybody has gone deeper into the law of one material and the interrelationships with the tarot cards, I'd love to know what you think. I have met people that live their lives around this stuff to the point where it becomes a sickness, not necessarily in looking at the archetypes, but they can't make a decision without it. They, every major decision that they have, they look at the cards and maybe that's just a, a state that you go through when you're trying to understand your instincts and your mind and the future and the path. I'm not saying it's wrong. Maybe it's right. Maybe it is a way of activating and opening up those archetypes within your mind is looking at these cards. I would just love to know your path using the tarot. It's interesting to look at the history of it and that it was brought to this planet from another planet. And perhaps the Chaldeans and, the, and Sumer and Mesopotamians were also influenced by other extraterrestrial intelligences that were bringing this information. And I don't quite understand. They're saying there are essentially magical adepts that learn magic from this process. That's what I want to know. If I can gain magical power to help other people using the archetypes, how do I do that? I'd like to understand. The only way that I've understood how to do that is through the law of assumption, which is assuming states. And there are key states that we all kind of go through that are mentioned biblically and in other spiritual texts. But I don't really understand the tarot stuff. And as Jim McCarty explains, it is super advanced and very difficult to understand. So I'm posting this episode as as a student. I don't understand and I want to learn. And sometimes by teaching this stuff or by reading about it, I learn more. Clearly there's something to it. It has called to me the idea that there is this archetypal system and that's all that I can basically say. And I still don't fully understand it. So we may do some meditations with different tarot cards and focusing on them and see if that enables us. Obviously it's what the golden dawn used and we'll see if that is powerful enough. I'll experiment with it. And if anybody has any further recommendations on text or material to further explore this idea of exploring the archetypes of the tarot and using it to enhance your own magical power, I would like to know. Put it in the comments. Give a like to this video so we can expand our knowledge. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to the reality revolution.